comment on the perceived tension between protecting the public from threats to national security, from national security threats, and vis-a-vis -vis fighting terrorism, uh, sorry, vis-a-vis -vis protecting human rights. If you look at this book, this was written, developed by ICJ in 2005. This is the report of the Eminent Jurists Panel on Terrorism, Counterterrorism, and Human Rights. This is a global study which was um, developed by ICJ of terrorism, counterterrorism terrorism measures of countries all over the world. This study was started in 2005 and this report was completed in 2009. Although this report was completed in 2009, everything here is still very relevant to the discussions now. And this is again why I'm saying that whatever I'm going to say now is not really new. It's really just repeating what the other, other speakers said and also repeating what the eminent jurists panel in this report have said over and over again through the decades, through the years. So on the perceived tension between um, addressing national security threats and fighting terrorism vis-a-vis -vis protecting human rights, I would like to say that the interest of fighting terrorism or upholding national security does not collide with the interest of promoting and protecting human rights. That We have to be clear about that. There is no contradiction. There is no inconsistency. In fact, promoting and protecting human rights is a key element in fighting terrorism and protecting national security. It is an effective weapon in defending de democratic societies like Malaysia. I would like to assume that. Um, I contribute to the population of Malaysia, so I would like to assume that Malaysia is a democratic society. Um, why am I saying that? First, protecting human rights, coming from an organization of um, a global organization of judges and lawyers, we would like to think that protecting human rights requires an independent judiciary. People are assured that even in the face of violent attack, they will get fairness and accountability from their judiciary. A well-operating criminal justice system will definitely deter terrorism. It will disrupt terrorist networks. It will catch and punish those who commit crimes and ensure the release of those mistakenly caught. And this goes into the second reasoning, the second reason I have why protecting and promoting human rights will actually fight terrorism. Human rights will address a remedy, will address and remedy genuine injustices that may engender and encourage terrorism or violent extremist actions. Sometimes violent conflict is caused by genuine grievances, and these genuine grievances are exploited by terrorists for their own ends. And we have seen in the past, and I echo um, what Dr. Amiga has pointed out earlier, governments that violate human rights feed and fuel into these grievances. So a clear commitment by the government to respect and protect human rights could bring to an end real or alleged grievances, or at the very least, secure greater legitimacy for its counter-terrorism efforts. The second thing I would like to emphasize, and it is very clearly laid out in this book, is that the national security doctrine, it's not new. In fact, when the ICJ started looking at, um, uh, um, started developing this report in 2005, it did not only look at the present situation, the, 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 the counter-terrorism terrorism efforts, um, during that particular period of time. But it looked into how national security and terrorism issues were dealt with in the past. 
This was done by the ICJ to see whether the threat that we are facing now is indeed exceptional and unprecedented, as claimed by many government authorities. It is always argued that the threats we are facing now are exceptional and unprecedented, and therefore, it is always argued that it is necessary to have exceptional responses. The ICJ found that this argument that the threats that we are facing now are exceptional, this argument is actually quite problematic in that it risks justifying the introduction of measures that may be violative of human rights. It also risks blinding governments to mistakes made in the past that may happen again. So these things, all these threats, it has, been, it has happened in the past. This is not new, this is not just happening now. In fact, take for instance the national security doctrine. This was around even in the 1970s and the 1980s and adopted by a number of Latin American states. And as discussed early this morning in Malaysia, this was actually in a way adopted also in the war against communism in the, in, from 1948 to 1960. By examining what happened in the past, the ICJ concluded that there are lessons that we have forgotten. These lessons in particular, I'm going to point out too, are that there is a danger of using the approach where the concept of national security is broadly and ambiguously defined. And this has been discussed over and over again by several of the panelists today. And the second one is that there is great danger in not providing adequate safeguards to ensure that derogations in, time of, in times of emergency are in line with international law. Let me go back first to the first point, that it is dangerous to define national security broadly and ambiguously. This was at the very first instance raised by the chair of Suhaka, that overbroad language in national security laws opens the door to wide discretionary powers without clear legal limits on, on implementation. So if you have broadly drafted laws, such as the National Security Council law in Malaysia, it can actually result in imposing impermissible restrictions on the rights to freedom of information, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly and association. I know that Malaysia is not a state party to the ICCPR. But I would still like to quote the UN Human Rights Council, noting that it is the main source of human rights standards, and many of these standards, in fact, most of these standards, form part of customary international law. So I would like to say and point out that the UN Human Rights Council has criticized the vague and legally undefined concept of national security, as well as its application as a basis to arrest and detain persons without citing a specific charge. The UN Human Rights Committee, sorry, the UN Human Rights Committee has also said that this was creating an atmosphere of fear and oppression for anyone critical of the government. And the UN Human Rights Committee, time and again, has always recommended that the concept of national security be clearly defined by law. Second lesson that we have not learned as a human race, perhaps, is that um, it is always dangerous to not provide adequate safeguards to ensure that derogations in times of emergency are in line with international law. So when a state of emergency is enforced, it is really very crucial that effective mechanisms are in place to supervise or to limit the exercise of the state's special powers, and that there are independent and impartial and effective bodies that are mandated to review and monitor the exercise and necessity of the maintenance of such powers. This is to ensure that human rights are not unnecessarily or disproportionately limited. I'm not 
um, I would have said a lot more about what international law um, says about um, not having safeguards, but everyone else said something about it already. So you see, my notes have basically crushed out everything. So I'm not going to take long, so I see happy faces, especially for Sh from Shamini. But there's one thing that I'd like to leave um, in this group. There's always the claim that the current set of international human rights laws cannot accommodate the type of threats that we are facing now. That is what people are always saying. Oh, you know, these laws, these international human rights instruments are so outdated. It doesn't take into consideration the type of terrorism that we are facing now, the type of national security threats that we are facing now. But so then we have to ask the question, is it true? Can international human rights instruments, can they not accommodate the types of threats that we are facing now? We have to always remember that the experts who drafted some of these key international human rights instruments, at the time that they were drafted, these experts, these people, these human beings have just come out of the darkest chapter of the 20th, 20th century and probably all of human history. They know very well the potential for abuses brought about by war. The key international human rights instruments were not drafted within the context of peace and stability. They were not drafted with peace and stability in mind. These international human rights laws were drafted primarily so that states would be able to respond to the most serious of crises, to the most serious of wars, in whatever form they may take. Thank you very much.